Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And happy Valentine's Day. Please accept this as a token to all of your significant others who allowed you to come out tonight. I'm Dr. Charles Dubrovner. I'm president and co-founder of Global Bioethics Initiative, also known as GBI. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this our organization's launching event. Global Bioethics Initiative is a non-governmental organization that was established in July of 2011. It's driven by the commitment to impart knowledge and understanding of the ethical, legal, and social challenges of ongoing medical and biotechnological developments. This evening's event is the first in a series that we are planning. The focus tonight is on organ trafficking and its health and security implications. Over the next three years, we're going to be examining the ethical, legal, and social aspects of reproductive and sexual rights and of population aging. The experts we have assembled for this evening's panel have very broad backgrounds and extensive experience. I have no doubt that you'll find their presentations to be both illuminating and thought-provoking. We look forward to a lively exchange of views on this most pressing issue, which of yet remains to have been adequately addressed. We hope that these deliberations will pave the way for concrete actions to combat this crime, such as what specific areas for further research should be prioritized, and what mechanisms and policies should be introduced. I am now pleased to introduce the moderator of our discussion, Dr. Anna Lita, co-founder and executive director of GBI. Dr. Lita has a PhD in social philosophy and applied ethics from Bowling Green University. She's carefully studied and followed developments in organ transplantation and trafficking, and I'm sure you'll find that she's well-versed on the issues and passionate about a need for their solution. So please welcome Dr. Lita. Thank you, Dr. Dubrovner, for this uh, wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome once again to our panel discussion, which, uh, as you have heard from uh, Dr. Dubrovner, our president coincides with the launch of Global Biotics Initiative. This panel brings uh, together brilliant minds in medicine, bioethics, medical anthropology, <coughs> and global security. Please allow me to introduce the Board of Directors of the Global Bioethics Initiative. I will begin with the ladies, and I would like you to stand up, if you don't mind. Ms. Shirin Carson is <coughs> currently Director of We Serve and Special Projects Manager at the School of Biomedical Engineering, Science and Health Systems at Drexel University. Dr. Caroline Dubrovner, she's Professor of Political Science and Criminal Justice at Pace University. She also serves as the Secretary of the Board. Dr. Nina Urban, she's a psychiatrist and Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at Columbia University. Rachel Mayanja, some of you know her. She's former Assistant Secretary General and Special Advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations on Gender Issues and Advancement of Women. Now, the man. We have a fair balance. Mr. Phil Henderson, President of Sudna Foundation. Dr. Tony Vernillo is a professor at NYU College of Dentistry. <laughs> Mr. Jay Sever is founding partner of Sever and Fork CPAs and the treasurer of Global Biotics Initiative. I extend my special thanks and welcome to the members of the United Nations missions, members of the press, friends and colleagues, for taking the time on this Valentine's Day to attend this special event. 
Many thanks to the Turkey Center in New York City for offering the delightful space for our cocktail reception that follows. And finally, I thank most sincerely the students who have volunteered their time to work with GBI, some of them from New York University, others from Columbia University. They are my heroes. And in the past three months, they have spent hours on end to organize this important event, and their work is not done yet. I am truly honored to be the moderator of this debate. All of us who have been engaged in organizing it have done so with a great amount of enthusiasm. We strongly believe that this kind of space is absolutely necessary to enable exchange of new views and collaboration between academics, civil society, and members of the international community, including the United Nations. The topic for the panel discussion today mirrors what Professor Art Kaplan has often said, doing bioethics in the real world with all the pitfalls and rewards which it entails. Of course, we expect this evening and we look forward to big rewards. I'd like to kindly ask the panelists to limit your presentations for about 15 minutes so that we can allow for a Q&A session for about 45, 60 minutes. Now I would like to invite our first panelist to address the audience. Professor David Rothman is the Bernard Schomberg Professor of Social Medicine, Professor of History, and the Director of the Center on Medicine as a Profession at the College of Physicians and Surgeons, Columbia University. He has explored human rights and ethics in medicine, addressing abuses in the conduct of human experimentation, how AIDS came to infect Romanian orphans, and how trafficking in organs for transplantation became a global phenomenon. Professor Rothman, confess to minor astonishment that on Valentine's Day, a holiday which we don't really celebrate, uh, so many of you have come out to explore these issues which are difficult and complicated. Uh, if I was going to put a title on my talk, um, I think I would label it uh, Organ Transplantation, colon, The Perfect Storm. Uh, and I want to take a few minutes with you tonight to contextualize uh, how we got into the business of organ transplantation, the developments in the US, and then the problems as the uh, technology system uh, procedures uh, moved uh, worldwide. Uh, some of you I know are in medicine. I'm anticipating that many of you are in law and human rights. Uh, and it's not always been the case that uh, human rights took on a very basic uh, interest in what those of us coming out of the other field would call uh, medical uh, issues. Uh, AIDS changed that, but transplantation changed that. Um, 30 seconds on biography. Uh, I'm a PhD, not an MD, but hold a chair in medicine uh, at, at, at PNS. And my human rights friends, um, Lawyers, uh, for the most part, uh, were always a little, uh, uh, well, not put, I mean, not impressed or put off, but, you know, always kind of, you know, wondered about, you know, this colleague of theirs who actually sat on the medical school faculty. Uh, this became uh, relevant to our story tonight uh, because beginning middle, late 80s, um, I'd start getting faxes from Human Rights Watch uh, about one or another story involving uh, abuse in the world of kidneys, uh, whether it was India, Egypt, Guatemala, uh, and the faxes would come, you know, come on, Rothman, what's going on here? Uh, they turned to me because I was probably the only person they knew in the medical world 
uh, with a concern for human rights. This is some time ago. Uh, and not only was I trying to explain, but I found myself completely and totally intrigued and went on a series of missions for Human Rights Watch uh, to look at some of the practices. This eventually culminated in a report that we did. Um, we used the, it was the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center. So the report in the middle 90s uh, was about organ trafficking uh, under the rubric of um, the, uh, a Bellagio report. So much for my entry into this field, I'm sure in the discussion we'll be hearing more about your own entries into this field. Yeah, although I have gray hair and a memory, uh, I was still astonished um, when I was thinking about how to open this for you to realize that we've been in the transplant business, medically speaking, for half a century. Uh, or the first of the uh, major uh, transplants is kidney transplants, uh, done up at, at Harvard, Joseph Murray, 1954. The first, as many of you may know, uh, the first of heart transplants, uh, 1967, Christian Barnard uh, in South Africa. From the very beginning, from the first days, if you will, of organ transplant, uh, there were controversies, conflicts, uncertainties, uh, because there was always something odd, unusual, provocative uh, about taking an organ from one, one person's body and putting it into another. In the beginning, well, in the beginning it wasn't cadaveric either. Uh, some of you will know the Murray story, uh, identical twins, one with failing, one with failing kidneys, uh, a brother uh, whose kidneys were fine. Uh, they were both, well, I think under 10 years old, parents uh, dealing with Murray, uh, experimental data, uh, but no precedent. Parents agreed with Murray that the healthy child would, I have to put donate in quotes, uh, his kidney uh, to the uh, sick brother, but uh, they could not seal the deal without going to the Massachusetts courts because uh, the physicians were worried, others were concerned. Why, why would you remove, why would you subject a healthy child to a major surgical intervention, uh, in the legal terminology perhaps assault, uh, when he was too young to give consent? Uh, the court, as you well know, decided otherwise. Not a very, I mean, a, a, the argument wasn't altogether powerful, uh, but it talked about the fact that his siblings, uh, if the younger brother died and the older brother could have saved him, the older brother would always live under the shadow of regret. Uh, they allowed the transplant to go forward. Uh, it was successful. They did have the great advantage of identical twins. Um, and we begin the world of a kidney transplant, which soon, in that point, I'll come back to this later, which then moves, if you will, uh, from uh, living related uh, to the world of cadaveric. Uh, controversies also uh, uh, around Barnard. Uh, he had studied under uh, transplant surgeons that were growing their uh, field at Stanford, Shumway, uh, and he kind of bolted and did it on his own. There were always questions about how competent he was to do it. Questions also about, into, you know, whites giving to blacks, blacks giving to white. Just, I, I raise this not to resolve it at all, but just something, some clouds uh, over the sunshine um, of successful um, outcomes. Obviously, transplant goes forward. Uh, the results in the US and other developed countries are, are quite good. The surgical skills, and we'll stay with kidney and uh, cardiac, uh, demanded, and there's a reason why I'm raising this, demanded of the operating surgeon uh, are not extraordinary. Inside, inside the field, uh, cardiac transplantation, kidney transplantation, uh, not extraordinarily difficult. The transplant that is difficult uh, and demands extraordinary skill, et cetera, et cetera, is liver. And if you're going to do lung heart, and as we'll see, those are not the areas uh, in which our problems uh, that we'll be talking about tonight arise. Uh, for better or for worse, doing kidney or, or heart transplants 
Uh, obviously, you need the skill set, but they're not extraordinary skills. The problem from the very beginning was not medical skill. The problem from the very beginning, and we come right into this tonight, was supply. Uh, not enough uh, kidneys, uh, not enough hearts, uh, and um, shortage. Some of you who may know the history of the iron lung, when the iron lung was out there, the March of Dimes made sure no kid would ever need an iron lung and not get it. Uh, we still live in the aftermath of that mindset, you know, doing more is always doing better, apparently. Uh, dialysis machines uh, in the world of kidney failure. All right, there was a shortage for a while. Who shall live committees? Public storm. We don't live comfortably in this country with medical shortages. Uh, and in this area of tonight, we face extraordinary shortages. Now, the physicians and hospitals, uh, there's not, there's some things they can do, but on the whole, um, relatively cautious and kind of accommodating. Uh, it's changing a little, uh, but you know, let a uh, person with a driver's license that says, I want to be an organ donor, be in a position to die, be in a position to become an organ donor, and the family says, you know, I don't think we like that. Uh, uh, the donor's wish uh, is overridden. Nobody wants to take on a family that's opposing. There's a kind of conservatism, if you will, um, a, a, about that. Given the shortages, American physicians, uh, of course, remind us that they were trained to be doctors, not detectives. Uh, they're not very prone to look behind the organ. It arrives, you use it. You don't want to ask too many questions. And if the pressures build up a lot, uh, you know, bumping the line uh, is obviously not unheard of. But the major issues, I think, don't involve physicians in, in the context that I'm describing in these first years, so much as they uh, involve uh, the society. Uh, the American public and many European publics, although that's changing a little quicker than ours, has never been very forthcoming about cadaveric donation. For some, it's a religious question. For some, it's an extraordinary fearfulness uh, and anxiety about medicine. Gee, if I tell them that we will agree to a, a donation, cadaveric, the docs will bump them off too quickly. There are all kinds of questions, even in Christian Barnum, whether we bump them off too quickly. Uh, required request uh, that Art Kaplan help move. Uh, limited effect. Presumed consent, which works so well in countries like Austria and Belgium, never would take hold here. Um, and many civil liberties lawyers really did not want any part of uh, required of, of presumed consent on the grounds that we don't want the state having, if you will, any first rights to the body. Abortion was in the mind, uh, but uh, presumed consent has never taken hold in this country, and by all predictions, uh, won't uh, take hold. Facing this kind of limited supply and barriers which seem relatively insurmountable in the kidney world, uh, over the past 10, 15 years, uh, the resolution to the problem has been the living donor. At first, I mean going all the way back to Murray, if you will, at first family, uh, but very quickly kin and then friends and then this category, which I don't know if we'll get into it tonight or not, but the altruistic stranger, and where does altruism kind of end and uh, you know returns come? Very complicated. Uh, but now in the kidney world, in a place like Columbia, over 50% of kidney uh, transplants are done by living donor. We've also got good technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So we resolve, at least in kidney world, uh, the, li the, uh, the living donor uh, in those several capacities. Let me segue from the US and generally what I would say would hold in most developed countries to the developing world. And the first point you have to recognize early on, and it comes back to my point about the necessary skills, uh, the skill to be a transplant surgeon 
traveled worldwide relatively quickly. Some trained here, others trained elsewhere. Uh, it, it did not require all that much training. And level of competence obviously will vary, uh, but um, technical skill in kidney transplant is not reserved uh, for the highly developed countries. It goes out everywhere um, and can be done almost everywhere. Once the technology gets available in less developed countries, you immediately confront the problems of extraordinary disparities in social welfare, uh, in, in, in social well-being, in, in monetary terms. And you can, you know, it's a simplification, but you can, you know, you can, you know, run them one by one. So in India, a very wealthy group, upper middle class group, obviously many in poverty, uh, the connection through sale, uh, uh, not inevitable, but certainly uh, commonplace. Uh, other countries, uh, neighbors uh, who for one or another reason, generally religious, um, do not have a, much of a supply of kidneys. Um, I think of both Muslim countries and of Israel. Uh, you start to send, and again, monetary issues are not complicated there, you have the funds, you start to go around. So there are always these issues about how much is going out of you know, the Middle East countries uh, into neighboring countries. For a while before all the turmoil, Iraq was a, place, a basic place where, where procedures like this went on, where Egyptians would come. Uh, there were all kinds of issues about Israel-Russian ties, uh, but you get the dynamic. Uh, a neighboring country, lower state, lower uh, economic uh, capacity, neighboring state higher, uh, and, and, and the mesh. Then countries uh, which uh, exploitation almost ready, ready made, uh, and the perfect storm uh, earns its name. I want to close with uh, um, a kind of a warning or a caution. You do have a structured situation uh, in which uh, exploitation uh, is, uh, if you will, uh, omnipresent. The possibilities for exploitation, omnipresent. There's no question about that. But for reasons I do not fully understand, the world of transplantation as exploitation is simply rife with rumor. Uh, you know it in the classic, uh, guy goes into the bar, has a drink, takes the lady up, Valentine's Day, takes the lady upstairs uh, and wakes up uh, you know, uh, an hour later, having been drugged to read on the mirror, uh, call 911 or die. Uh, this is, to put it mildly, urban myth, totally apocryphal. Um, I was once giving a seminar on human rights and medicine, and one of my students said, oh, I know someone, it really happened. I promised him an A if he delivered the data. Uh, of course, he didn't. But the myth, the myth holds. Uh, but the, you know, I mean, and you got to be careful. Uh, sec secondly, um, we were in Guatemala. My wife was sending medical students to do human rights works in Guatemala. We arrive in Guatemala not on a transplant mission. And we are told about an American woman who has been clubbed into a coma because the Guatemalans feared she was kidnapping uh, children for their organs. Uh, and we were told this by highly reputable types. Uh, in fact, and they went on, children were uh, found, you know, in, in the cemetery missing their organs. Well, it turned out in a, in a matter of days, that this was again pure myth. Uh, I mean, the Guatemala story had absolutely no basis. And we in New York have had a series of stories where people all of a sudden, you know, I mean, look, I'll become an organ broker. They don't, it's, it's, I mean, this is sham stuff. They're ripping it off. I mean, you know, I'll get you a kidney. I'll get you the Empire State Building. Uh, but yet it, it becomes front page on the New York Times. The rumors are rampant, which means, which means something very, very important to an audience like this. We're all skeptical about data, and we're all skeptical about findings, right? I mean, we're trained to read between the lines and to worry about the accuracy, whether it's scientific data or anything else. 
I would only want to close by saying, in this area, again, for reasons I'm not sure I understand, the need to separate rumor from fact is absolutely critical. Yes, I am sure bad things happen, but oh my goodness, I want data. I want proof. I want evidence. Now, look, again, at some level, this is a truism. We want it everywhere. But in this area, more than almost any other I can think of, uh, the difficulty of separating rumor from fact uh, is extraordinarily important. So whatever, I mean, what, okay, so we, I leave you with, you know, twin messages. One, the stage is set for exploitation, for all the reasons I so quickly gave, but you know them. Two, the stage is set for rumor. And you've got to distinguish ever so carefully and be I mean, literally on the edge of your seat here or anywhere else. Am I hearing hypotheticals or am I hearing the real stuff? Uh, you'll decide. Thank you very much.